Thank you very much. Um, I welcome one and all to this um, very interesting session of uh, ICA webinar, our Wednesday evening online academics. Today we are in our session number 166 and we are di discussing cardiac output monitoring in cardiac and non-cardiac surgery. Before proceeding further, let me remind you about the forthcoming uh, 4th International and 14th National Conference of ICA, the Indian College of Anesthesiologists, which is coming up in the month of November, hosted by Narayana Health City, uh, Bangalore, Karnataka. And the theme is Safety in Anesthesia and Critical Care. The communication and the brochure must be available with you because um, we have started to circulate and uh, the registrations are pouring in. So on behalf of Indian College of Anesthesiologists, I welcome you all to join us physically in this uh, forthcoming ICA Con 2023. Coming to today's program, as I mentioned, the theme is cardiac output monitoring in cardiac and non-cardiac surgery, which will be headed by a cream of moderators like uh, Dr. Rupa Sridhar, Dr. Deepa Chandra Mohan, Dr. Harish, Dr. Ratan Gupta, and our Dean National, Dr. Murli Kanchi. I know all these moderators need no introduction. Dr. Rupa Sridhar is a professor in cardiac anesthesia from uh, Srijitra Tirunar Institute in uh, Trivandrum, Kerala. Dr. Deepa Chandra Mohan is from uh, uh, intensivist from MER Cancer Center, Kodikod, Calicut, Kerala. Dr. Harish is an accomplished intensivist and an um, established trainer um, in uh, European degrees in intensive care and also takes uh, much interest in cardiac anesthesia. Dr. Ratan Gupta is a cardiac anesthesiologist, senior cardiac anesthesiologist from Narena Health, Bangalore. And of course, uh, Dr. Murli Kanchi is our Dean, National Dean of Indian College of Anesthesiologists, uh, a senior cardiac anesthesiologist and a passionate academician. So Dr. Murli Kanchi will be uh, joining us soon. So uh, let me hand over the session to Dr. Rupa Sridhar to start the proceedings. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Sanish. Welcome to all. We'll soon start with the first session that is Thermodilution method of measuring cardiac output using a pulmonary artery catheter. I invite Dr. Nishant Raja Dyaksha from Narayana Institute of Cardiac Sciences, Bengaluru, to start the session. Dr. Nishan. Topic today is thermodilution technique to measure cardiac output using pulmonary artery catheter. There are various methods to determine the cardiac output. In this session, we will discuss the thermodilution technique to measure cardiac output using pulmonary artery catheter. But before we come back to this slide, let us quickly go through the pulmonary artery catheter. It was in the 1970s that Dr. Swan and Gans invented the pulmonary artery catheter and it reached its zenith in the 1980s due to the multiple publication advocating its potential benefits in routine clinical practice. This is the original 1.7 mm Swan Gans catheter. It has two cross sectional uh, lumens. The larger one was used for pressure monitoring and the smaller circular one was used for balloon inflation. There is no facility to administer injectate or measure the temperature. But 50 years down the line, we have a pulmonary artery catheter, which is equipped with various components to measure pressure as well as cardiac output. In the intermittent thermodilution technique, the catheter has a thermistor which is at about 4 cm from the tip 
and uh, it measures the temperature of the blood in the pulmonary artery catheter pulmonary artery as it moves past the catheter its optimum sensitivity is between 30 to 40 degrees celsius and it is buried inside the polyvinyl chloride structure so that it prevents the intracardiac microcurrents and short circuit this is the thermal filament which is coated uh, with a coiled wire at a depth of 15 to 25 centimeter in a continuous thermodilution catheter this is the thermo element of that catheter and for safety purposes the heating is limited to a maximum temperature of 44 degrees this is the hub of the pa catheter and it separates into a quadra equina like uh, in a quadra equina fashion of multicolored lumens and the important features here to note are that the proximal injected port is used uh, to inject the thermodilution fluid the thermistor connector which is used for thermodilution measurement and the power plug for heating the, th uh, the heating filament now we come back to cardiac output monitoring thermodilution technique can be intermittent as well as continuous the intermittent technique is the most commonly used invasive method of cardiac output measurement and it is considered as gold standard they use the stuart hamilton equation to uh, determine the cardiac output which we will uh, come back to in subsequent slide this is the intermittent thermodilution technique a known amount of fluid is injected as a bolus into the proximal lumen which opens at the level of the right atrium the resultant change in the temperature of the in the pulmonary artery blood is recorded by the thermistor which is present at the tip of the catheter in adults an injected volume of 10 milliliters is used whereas in children 0.5 ml per kg is recommended it is important to have real-time display of the thermodilution curve uh, to measure the cardiac or to measure each cardiac output measurements the rate of the blood flow is inversely proportional to the change in the temperature over time Thus, the mean decrease in temperature is inversely proportional to the cardiac output. The Stuart Hamilton equation, which describes this relationship, will be discussed in the subsequent slides. Continuous thermodilution technique. In this technique, a small quantity of heat is released from the thermal filament, which is situated 15 to 25 centimeters from the tip of the catheter, which corresponds to the level of the right ventricle. The resultant thermal signal is measured by the thermistor at the tip of the catheter. The heating filament is cycled on and off in a pseudo-random binary sequence and the cardiac output is derived from the cross-correlation of the measured pulmonary artery temperature with a known sequence of the heating filament activation. Typically, a displayed value of the cardiac output is updated every 30 to 60 seconds but it represents the average value of the cardiac output measured over the previous three to six minutes. Therefore, on one hand, we have a good reproducibility, good precision and accuracy. But on the other hand, we have a delayed response, especially during unstable hemodynamic conditions. A glance at the history. It was in the early 19th century that George Neal Stewart started his experiments on dogs to measure cardiac output this was the era where no data was available on cardiac output and in his initial experiments he used 1.5 ml 1.5 percent normal saline and allowed it to flow through the bloodstream presence of sodium chloride in the blood changes the resistance of the blood which he measured using a wheatstone's bridge transducer and this helped him to determine the flow of the blood which he calculated as fraction of body weight per second which was the fashion at that time then came william hamilton in 1929 who published an article with kinsman Eatle. he used various dyes like the evans blue and injected them into the venous system he measured the concentration at regular intervals from the radial artery ideally for mathematical accuracy and integration should have been used but it was practically impossible at that time but now with the advent of modern software driven machines the same formula can be mutated into a modern form which we refer to as the stuart hamilton equation according to this equation the cardiac output is dependent on the difference in the temperature of the blood and the injected volume of the injected 
a constant k1 and k2 k1 is also known as the density constant which is a factor that is measured from the specific heat and specific gravity of both the indicator as well as blood that is <clears throat> this k1 will be different for any given substance as injected and it will be influenced by the hematocrit of the patient k2 is the calibration constant and it is another factor which represents the change in the temperature corresponding to each height interval of the thermodilution curve. The denominator in this formula is the area under the extrapolated thermodilution curve. The thermodilution curves are visibly different in different pathophysiological state. The higher the cardiac output, faster will be the blood flow and shorter will be the, and uh, shorter and steeper will be the thermodilution curve. In low cardiac output, uh, the curve is slow and lazy and has a large area under the curve. This is because less blood is available for the injected to mix with. Usually, three cardiac output measurements are performed in rapid succession and the average value provides the most accurate result. Suppose we use only one measurement, then a difference of 22% uh, in the subsequent measurement would indicate a clinically significant difference. Whereas if we use three measurements and average out, uh, uh, average out the uh, for uh, average out the result for measuring the cardiac output, a difference of only 13% would signify clinically significant difference. Factors affecting thermodilution measurements. The thermodilution techniques measures the right, right ventricular output and assumes it to be say, uh, similar to the left ventricular output. But with presence of intracardiac shunts, this right ventricular and left ventricular output will not be equal, resulting in an error in the measurement. Patients with severe tricuspid or pulmonary valve regurgitation will cause additional problems as the incompetent wall will result in recirculation of the indicator. <clears throat> Unrecognized fluctuation in temperature may also influence the cardiac output measurements. In most patients, pulmonary artery blood falls into somewhat um, the initial period post cardiopulmonary bypass. This is because the rewarmed vascular and vessel rich tissue will redistribute the heat to the relatively cold body core. Therefore, the thermal baseline of the patient is unstable and measurements that are made during these uh, during this time is um, grossly unreliable and most of the time it leads to a marked underestimation of the true cardiac output also rapid fluid infusion would decrease the pulmonary artery temperature there is one controversy surrounding intermittent thermodilution cardiac output monitoring that is the timing of the measurement with respect to the respiratory cycle this is because the respiratory cycle influences the right ventricular stroke output. During positive pressure ventilation, the stroke output can vary by as much as 50% during throughout the respiratory cycle. Although the reproducibility of the measurements will be improved if the injections are synchronized in the same phase of the respiratory cycle, it has been observed that multiple injections during different phases of the respiratory cycle should be taken and then averaged out to get more accurate results. Last, the measured thermodilution cardiac output can overestimate true cardiac output during low flow states because of significant heat loss from slow injected transit. Errors can be due to the technique. It can be due to the volume or temperature of the injected. If the injected is too cold, it can cause underestimation of the cardiac output, whereas a very small volume of injected can overestimate the cardiac output. Room temperature uh, in uh, injectates provide less accurate results, but they are safer, whereas cold injectates are more accurate, but can induce bradycardia and decrease the cardiac output. The continuous the thermodilution technique has been widely accepted into clinical practice for a number of practical reasons. Although these catheters are more expensive than the standard catheters, it obviates the need for a, uh, uh, the bolus injections, reducing the workload on the nurses and the potential risk of fluid overload and infections. However, the continuous 
um, continuous cardiac output monitoring technique and the catheter requires a significant amount of time to warm up and may work poorly in environments which has a large thermal noise like the cardiac operating room. Recent observations also suggest that a pneumatic compression devices may also introduce artifacts that appears as large variation in the measured volume in otherwise stable patients. Although the modifications in the continuous cardiac output software provides a stat mode or a rapid response mode, acute changes in cardiac output are still detected better uh, by other techniques compared to continuous cardiac output monitoring. And therefore, this continuous cardiac output monitoring is a trade-off between rapid response time and overall accuracy and stability of the displayed value. While it might be useful in clinical decision making, there is no study which demonstrates improved patient outcome after the use of continuous pulmonary artery catheter. There is always a debate between interchangeability of intermittent and continuous thermodilution techniques. In a meta-analysis and systemic review published in Critical Care in the year 2021, Karim Kozitel evaluated 54 studies to determine the accuracy and interchangeability between these two techniques in post-surgical and critically ill patients. Though the heterogeneity across the clinical studies was very high, the authors concluded that the overall accuracy of continuous thermodilution technique was better compared to that of intermittent. But continuous thermodilution barely passes the interchangeability criteria with that of intermittent pulmonary artery thermodilution technique. I sincerely thank Dr. Murlidhar Kanchi sir for his support because of which this presentation was possible and I thank the moderators and the listeners for their patient listening. Thank you. Rajshri ma'am, over to you please. Hello, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. The question will be at the end of the session. Please unshare the screen for the introduction of the next speaker. I request Deepa to take over the second session. Good evening, everyone. I'll be coming up with the slides of the second speaker. So now that uh, we had a wonderful lecture on uh, PA catheter and uh, the thermodilution technique, uh, the next topic would be a transpulmonary thermodilution technique for measuring the cardiac output as well as uh, other indices. So I now invite our speaker, Dr. Madhu Rajadhyaksha, uh, who is an alumnus of BJ Medical College, Pune, and right now an IACTA fellow at uh, Narayana Kridyalaya, Bengaluru. Uh, she is especially interested in cardiac anesthesiology, hemodynamic monitoring, uh, difficult airway, as well as pediatric anesthesia. She has uh, bagged several prizes for the best uh, paper, as well as best posters in various national and international conferences. And uh, she also has 12 publications to her credit in various national and international journals. So over to you, Dr. Madhu. Please continue with the presentation. Please continue with the presentation. Yes, sir. It has already started, sir.
very good evening to respected faculty moderators and my dear listeners firstly i would like to thank dr mulidhar kanchi sir for giving me an opportunity to present this topic trans pulmonary thermodilution techniques for cardiac output monitoring i would also like to thank the moderators for introducing me we'll start from where dr nishant has left first we'll see what is the basic difference between pulmonary and trans pulmonary thermodilution techniques in pulmonary thermodilution technique we inject the indicator into the right atrium and measure it into the pulmonary artery while in trans pulmonary approach we inject the indicator into the internal jugular vein and measure it in the iliac artery the volume of distribution of indicator is much larger in trans pulmonary thermodilution technique so larger the volume of distribution larger will be the temperature loss more chances of error the classic trans pulmonary thermodilution technique gives us intermittent cardiac output however both pulmonary artery catheter and trans pulmonary platforms have an option of giving continuous variables these variables are based on pulse contour analysis now there is something else which trans pulmonary approach gives us that is volumetric variables which makes it more reliable in intensive care setups so basically people have stopped using swan gans in intensive care saying that it increases the mortality although looking very closely it has been used in morbid patients so critical patients have poor outcome to overcome i would say a false barrier to use of swan came in a device whereby you could do a thermodilution by a central line and could measure using an art line these devices got clubbed under the heading of trans pulmonary thermodilution the basics of trans pulmonary thermodilution is exactly the same as pulmonary thermodilution we need to have a constant blood flow there should be no or minimal loss of the indicator between the injection and the detection point there should be complete mixing of indicator with the blood the indicator must pass the detection point only once now here in comes a small hustle unlike pulmonary artery here the detection point is much peripheral in the iliac artery in trans pulmonary approach so at the end i would say whichever device you use may it be pulmonary or trans pulmonary technique you should generate a good thermodilution curve this is how trans pulmonary thermodilution technique goes in this you have a injected which we inject into the internal jugular vein or the subclavian vein then it goes into the right atrium then into the right ventricle then moves into the pulmonary circulation then into the left atrium ends up into the left ventricle from the left ventricle it goes into the aorta then into the iliac artery and trans pulmonary thermodilution actually captures the end diastolic volume of all the four cardiac chambers clubbed in with whatever blood is available in the pulmonary circulation in the end of diastolic phase so this is conceptually what is trans pulmonary thermodilution and since we capture the pulmonary blood volume we try to take out many more variables which are which a conventional swan will not take it out the other fundamental difference is that swan gans catheter basically functions on principles of pressure on the other side trans pulmonary technique we have volumetric variables there is a age old debate in intensive care and cardiac ors which variable is better pressure or volume so to put it in one line measure of cardiac ca measure of cardiac preload volumetric indices perform better but when it comes to assessing the risk of pulmonary edema pulmonary occlusion pressure performs better but neither your volumetric indices nor the pressure indices actually are used to check the fluid responsiveness these are the same curves which dr nishant has showed us the important thing when we do a trans pulmonary thermodilution technique we need to calculate what is mean transit time mean transit time in a very simple word is 50% of area under the curve for the second equation we use down slope time which basically means time it takes from 85% of temperature response to 45% of temperature response these are the two important things students should remember as per theoretical point of view 
mean transit time and down slope time. This is a pictorial representation I have pulled out from a review article by Monet et al, which is very comprehensive. I will put it in a very simple word. When we do a transpulmonary thermodilution technique, which variables do we get? One we get is a global and diastolic volume. Volume of four cardiac chambers, it measures the cardiac preload. We also get two indices which actually measures cardiac systolic function. Just please notice the terms. I have not said LV systolic function. It is cardiac function index. I'll discuss this in details later. Other is global ejection fraction. And these two important indices come out from transpulmonary thermodilution technique. Parameters which can derive after thermodilution technique are also extravascular uh, lung water. It helps us to calculate the amount of water in the lungs. Now for doing a transpulmonary thermodilution, when we do uh, thermodilution, we get cardiac output. We multiply that cardiac output with mean transit time, we get a figure known as intrathoracic thermal volume. When we multiply cardiac output with downslope time, we get amount of blood which is there in the pulmonary circulation and in the lungs which is known as pulmonary thermal volume. If you see the diagram, if we subtract intrathoracic thermal volume and pulmonary thermal volume, we get a value known as global and diastolic volume. With the global and diastolic volume, if you have a multiplication factor of 1.25, we get what is known as extravascular lung volume. Although this lecture says it is transpulmonary based cardiac output monitor, I will just look first at global and diastolic volume because it's precursor to measurement of cardiac output. Global and diastolic volume increases as the right heart dilates. So the biggest fallacies in using transpulmonary thermodilution technique is that you are not imaging the heart. So if your volumetric variables are varying, you don't know why it is varying because these are all summation variables. Global and diastolic volume is a marker of cardiac preload, but pulmonary artery occlusion pressure is a better marker for risk of pulmonary edema. And as far as that, we use it in intensive care and cardiac ORs. Global and diastolic volume is classified as static marker of fluid responsive net, but definitely not the dynamic marker. Now, when we look at these two variables, cardiac function index and global ejection fraction, these are transpulmonary thermodilution derived variables of systolic function. First, we need to measure the global and diastolic volume very accurately. Cardiac function index is nothing but cardiac output divided by global and diastolic volume. While global ejection fraction is stroke volume which we get divided by global and diastolic volume, the logic is we assume left ventricular and diastolic volume is one fourth of global and diastolic volume. Now these variables, cardiac function index and global ejection fraction are variables of cardiac systolic function. But they track changes of echo derived left ventricular ejection fraction very well in most of the studies. So they are almost parallel to left ventricular ejection fraction. So where are the problems with this transpulmonary thermodilution technique variables? So now I am talking about both the volumetric variables as well as the cardiac output. When there is right heart dilatation, global ejection fraction increases. We have seen this previously. The cardiac function index and global ejection fraction decrease despite the fact that LV contractility remains unchanged. Keep in mind my friends, the moment right heart starts dilating, this device malfunctions. So the first thing to strike you is if you are getting values which are not commensurate with the trends of your trends or your clinical picture, please immediately put an echo probe and look at the right heart if it dilates. Then, then game is up for a particular patient. Both the cardiac function index and global ejection fraction are load dependent marker 
as we say in intensive care to increase the preload it increases you increase the afterload it will decrease so they are not relatively indicate independent markers of systolic function of heart another important thing is when we use this transpulmonary thermodilution technique we have no idea about the cardiac structures we cannot image the heart global ejection fraction thus is a marker of cardiac systolic function rather than lv systolic function limitations for using transpulmonary thermodilution technique it is not reliable if cardiac output is less than 2 liters intermittent uh, measurements only cannot be used with ecmo in interest of time let us quickly discuss two minimally invasive cardiac output monitoring which are based on transpulmonary thermodilution technique in pico the stroke volume can be calculated from area under the flow time curve which is derived from the arterial pressure waveform wave using a calibration factor the advantage of this technique is it is less invasive only needs an arc line and a cvc it is a continuous variable reasonably accurate the disadvantage is the calibration factor needs to be measured dependent on arterial waveform and it is not accurate when patient has atrial fibrillation or has an iabp lidco or lithium dilution cardiac output monitor the principle is indicator dilution in which a small amount of lithium chloride say 0.15 to 0.3 millimoles is injected via a central line or a peripheral line the resulting arterial lithium concentration time curve is recorded by withdrawing the blood past a lithium sensor which is attached to patient's existing arterial line the advantages of this technique is it does not require mixed venous blood numerous indicator op options are available and it has good accuracy the disadvantages accuracy is highly technique dependent so here i conclude my friends beyond cardiac output transpulmonary thermodilution technique provides several indices that helps us answer the clinician ask themselves during hemodynamic monitoring it will be very interesting to see how progress in technology in the era of digital health will transform and improve this transpulmonary thermodilution technique thank you thank you dr madhu can i start yes please yeah good evening all so next speaker uh, dr elizabeth uh, preeti she is going to speak on uh, one of the minimally invasive cases that is flow track and one of the bit non invasive method that is finger cuff method in terms of cardiac output monitoring uh, over to you dr elizabeth good evening everyone i'm dr elizabeth Uh, today we'll be talking about cardiac output monitoring by flow track and finger cuff method i have no disclosures uh cardiac output monitoring uh continuous arterial blood pressure measurement is an integral part of hemodynamic monitoring in patients treated in perioperative and inter in intensive care medicine besides arterial pressure monitoring the assessment and optimization of cardiac output or cardiac index 
is recommended in high risk surgical patients and patients with complex shock. Cardiac output monitoring using the flow track system is a minimally invasive method. It is used in critical care and perioperative settings to continuously measure and calculate cardiac output and other hemodynamic parameters. Flow track is a proprietary technology developed by Edwards Life Sciences. Um, the minimally invasive flow track system can be used for advanced hemodynamic monitoring. It automatically calculates key flow parameters every 20 seconds. It helps manage hemodynamic instability and helps an ensure adequate patient perfusion. The flow track system algorithm is based on the principle that aortic pulse pressure is proportional to stroke volume and inversely related to aortic compliance. The algorithm compensates for effects of compliance on pulse pressure based on age, gender, and body surface area. Through continuous beat detection and analysis, the flow track system algorithm allows for the ongoing use of stroke volume variation. Uh, the parameters that are calculated every 20 seconds are stroke volume, stroke volume variation, mean arterial pressure, systemic vascular resistance, and cardiac output. The flow track sensor parameters displayed on the hem on the hemosphere monitor show patient status at a glance for visual clinical support and increased clarity in volume administration. The stroke volume variation algorithm restores the respiratory component of the arterial pressure curve so that stroke volume variation continues to reflect the physiological effects of mechanical ventilation on the heart. Uh, pros of flow track can be used for continuous monitoring. It provides real-time beat to beat monitoring of cardiac output, stroke volume, and other hemodynamic parameters. This continuous data can be valuable in managing critically ill patients. Uh, it is minimally invasive. By it involves the placement of an arterial catheter. It is less invasive compared to other methods like thermodilution or pulmonary artery catheterization. Uh, it is rapid to set up. It is uh, compared to other techniques and it causes less patient discomfort compared to other methods. Uh, cons, uh, while flow track monitoring provides valuable data, its accuracy can be influenced by various factors, including patient-specific characteristics and changes in vascular compliance. The equipment and, dis and disposables for flow track monitoring can be costly, and ongoing maintenance is required. According to a study conducted by Andrea et al., they evaluated uh, the, the accuracy and trending ability of uh, fourth generation flow track and, uh, ca uh, ca and cardiac output monitoring by thermodilution pulmonary artery catheter measurements. Uh, in uh, patients with severe aortic valve stenosis, they evaluated cardiac output before and after the surgical valve replacement. In their study, it showed that there was a low level of agreement and poor trending ability of flow track compared to continuous thermal dilution pulmonary artery catheter in patients with severe aortic stenosis. Although there was a slight improvement after surgical valve replacement and cardiopulmonary bypass, the results were not within acceptable limits to replace cardiac, continuous cardiac output monitoring by PA catheter in this patient population. Uh, in another study conducted by Adam et al., they uh, studied, uh, they compared cardiac output monitoring using four methods. One was the intermittent thermodilution by uh, pulmonary artery catheter, endotracheal cardiac output monitoring, flow track, and 3D uh, transesophageal echocardiography. This study was conducted on uh, 44 patients who underwent elective non-emergency cardiac uh, pulmonary artery bypass grafting surgery. Uh, they found that uh, the endotracheal cardiac output monitoring, flow track, and 3D transesophageal echocardiography are not, interchangeable, uh, are not interchangeable with each other or to the reference standard that is invasive uh, in thermodilution uh, PA catheter method in patients undergoing non-emergent cardiac bypass surgery. Despite the negative result in this study and the majority of previous studies, these less invasive methods of cardiac output monitoring have continued to be, have continued to be used in the hemodynamic management of patients. Each device has its own distinct uh, technical features and inherent limitations. It is clear that no single device can be used universally for all patients. Different methods or devices should be selected based on individual patient condition, including the degree of invasiveness, measurement performance, and the ability to provide real-time continuous cardiac output reading. 
Uh, the next method of cardiac output monitoring is the finger cuff method. Uh, cardiac output monitoring using finger cuff method is a non-invasive technique that has gained attention as an alternative to more invasive methods of cardiac output monitoring. Uh, during the past years, innovative finger cuff technologies have become available and enable arterial pressure and cardiac output cardiac index to be estimated continuously using pulse wave analysis in a completely non-invasive manner. These finger cuff technologies continuously record the arterial pressure waveform using a finger cuff that measures the diameter of the finger artery with an integrated infrared photo photodiode and light detector. The finger cuff frequently adjusts its pressure to keep the blood volume in the finger artery constant throughout the cardiac cycle. From the pressure adjustments required to maintain a constant blood volume in the finger artery, the arterial pressure waveform can be derived and analyzed to estimate arterial pressure and cardiac output. This allows for continuous monitoring of arterial pressure and pulse waveforms. Uh, the principle of finger cuff technology uses a volume clamp method, also known as vascular unloading technique. Uh, this diagram shows the, uh, the finger cuff and the infrared transmission of the plethysmo cap. Uh, in the volume clamp method, uh, this is volume clamp. The counter pressure is applied by inflatable bladder inside the cup and is suggested to 1000 times per second to keep the arterial volume constant. The essence of the volume clamp method involves clamping the artery to a constant volume by dynamically providing equal pressure on either side of the arterial wall. The volume is measured by a photo plethysmograph built into the cup. Continuous recording of the cuff pressure results in real-time finger pressure waveform. Now, this is the physiological calibration method. In this uh, real-time method for determining the proper arter arterial unloaded volume, that is the volume without a pressure gradient across the arterial wall, it analyzes the curvature and sharpness of the plethysmograph during short episodes of constant pressure levels. It then automatically and periodically re recalibrates the system, allowing accurate tracking of the physiological changes. Uh, the, the parameters measured by finger cuff method are cardiac output, stroke volume, stroke volume variation, systemic vascular resistance, mean arterial pressure. Upon starting a measurement, the finger cuff can be used and reapplied for up to 72 hours on one patient. After eight hours of continuous monitoring on a single finger, the finger cuff should be reapplied to another finger. To increase comfort, two finger, two finger cuffs may be connected simultaneously to alternate the measurements between two fingers. This allows uninterrupted continuous monitoring up to 72 hours. Uh, this is non-invasive, does not require the insertion of catheters or probes into the body, which makes it less risky and more comfortable for the patient. It provides real-time data on blood pressure, pulse waveform, and cardiac output. It is quick to set up. Uh, cons, accuracy of the finger cuff method, it may not be as accurate of the as the thermal dilution or pulse counter analysis, uh, especially when rapid and significant hemo hemodynamic changes occur. Uh, accurate calibration of the device is essential for reliable measurement. And cost, the, uh, the equipment for finger cuff uh, based monitoring can be expensive and ongoing maintenance and calibration is needed. The finger cuff method for cardiac output monitoring can be a valuable tool in various clinical settings including perioperative care, intensive care units, and outpatient clinics. Its use should be considered alongside other clinical data, and healthcare professionals should be aware of its limitations and potential sources of error. In some cases, it may be used as a less invasive and more comfortable alternative to, uh, to invasive methods, but it should not replace the gold standard measurement when high accuracy is crucial. Limitations of uh, finger cuff method, it can't be used in patients with uh, it can be used in patients with uh, severe peripheral vasoconstriction, patients treated with high doses of vasopressors, and uh, it can be used in patients with uh, upper extremity edema. Uh, cardiac output measurements may become unreliable, unreliable due to impaired perfusion of the finger artery. According to a study conducted by Bernard et al., they uh, studied the non-invasive cardiac output monitoring in cardiothoracic surgery patients. Uh, their study showed that the clear side system, uh, finger cuff system, showed a good agreement, that is percentage error less than 30% with pulmonary artery thermodilution in 25 awake patients in the intensive care unit after CAVG surgery. 
Another study of 45 patients treated in the intensive care unit after cardiac surgery demonstrated poor agreement, that is percentage errors of more than 50% when cardiac output was measured simultaneously before and after the fluid challenge using the uh, clear side system and transpulmonary thermodilution. Several studies in patients treated in the intensive care unit after cardiac surgery, however, revealed that although the absolute agreement between clear site and pulmonary artery uh, cardiac output measurement was uh, uh, poor, the clear site system was able to track changes in cardiac output reliably over time. These are my references. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, that was a nice presentation. Am I audible? Yes, we are audible. Yeah. Um, now I invite uh, Dr. Uh, Akshita Ramani uh, to go ahead with the presentation uh, uh, regarding the, the cardiac output monitoring using uh, uh, transesophageal echocardiography. Uh, Dr. Uh, Akshita, uh, she has done an MBBS from uh, Raja Rajeshwari Medical College and her PG from uh, BJ Medical College, uh, Ahmedabad. And uh, now currently she is doing her uh, uh, DNB uh, cardiac uh, anesthesia at Narayan Hrudalaya. Uh, without much ado, I invite Dr. Akshita Ramani to go ahead with the presentation. Please share your presentation. Good morning, and Yeah, please go ahead with the presentation. Dr. Akshita, today I will be talking about echocardiography, particularly in the context of cardiac output monitoring. Uh, the disclosure is there is no conflict of interest present in the making of this presentation. So this presentation is going to concentrate on what are the different methods of echocardiography and uh, cardiac output monitoring in general. Uh, in terms of echocardiography particularly, there is always a debate regarding trans uh, thoracic versus trans esophageal echocardiography. And the parameters and methods that we various, uh, that we use to uh, monitor the cardiac output to using echocardiography, what are some of the advancements that have happened in this technology and some of the key points uh, from this discussion. So cardiac output, why do we really have to measure it and how do we measure it? So cardiac output is a measure of cardiac function. It can be a guide to fluid therapy and it will help titrate the vasopressors, inotropic agents as per the needs of the patient, which can be done in various setups, uh, whether it be cardiac or non-cardiac surgery. How it is monitored? So the gold standard technique was using the fixed principle, um, basically having the pulmonary artery catheter. Uh, over a period of time, we have tried to become more non-invasive in our process, and that is why we have a development of methods including echocardiography, pulse contour analysis, uh, uh, analysis and thoracic bioimpedance. So ultrasound-based measurement uh, of cardiac output happens by various techniques. It could be by uh, echocardiography, which could be transthoracic or transesophageal in nature. Um, also, uh, a more uh, recently developed ultrasonic cardiac output uh, monitor, ultrasound dilution techniques, and even transesophageal Doppler. So the principle of measurement. Uh, so the principle of measurement when we are utilizing echocardiography is basically uh, we are trying to measure uh, volume of a cylinder by um, an extension of the continuity equation. So the continuity equation uh, states that whenever you have an absence of valvular dysfunction or you do not have an intracardiac shunt, then we are assuming that the blood flow that is across uh, any of the valves uh, is going to be constant throughout the heart. So that is, there is going to be equal forward flow across each of the valves. Um, so we could actually measure the cardiac output across different valve areas also and it would still be valid. However, when we are looking at the cross-sectional area of the left ventricular outflow tract, it is more or less uh, essentially a circle which makes our uh, measurement uh, more, I think, easy. 
So the steps to measure the cardiac output. Uh, so when we are taking the left ventricular outflow track, uh, we are assuming that the cylinder's base is going to be represented by the cross-sectional area of the left ventricular outflow. And uh, that is calculated uh, after we are able to take the measurement of the left uh, ventricular outflow diameter. Assuming that to be a circle, we calculate it as pi d by 2 in, uh, into um, uh, pi d by 2 square, or that is just 0 0.785 into the diameter squared. The height of the cylinder in centimeters is calculated from the interrogation of the left ventricular outflow tract with a pulse wave Doppler. The height or distance can be then calculated from the velocities that are being measured by the pulse wave Doppler during the ejection phase as the integral of these velocities. So uh, what happens here is since the blood is flowing through uh, the cardiac system, which is going to be pulsatile in nature, when you have the instantaneous velocity that is being calculated in the ejection phase, um, that is going to be integrated over a period of time to get a sum total, which is represented by this area under the curve whenever you have the Doppler velocity profile, and that is going to give us your VTI. So your stroke volume is now going to be a calculation of that uh, volume of the cylinder, which is equivalent to the LVOT cross-sectional area into the LVOT VTI. So when we are taking the trans, uh, uh, trans thoracic uh, views of the echocardiography, uh, we are uh, using uh, mainly the parasternal long axis view uh, to calculate the LVOT diameter. Uh, this is a very crucial step because uh, the cross-sectional area is going to be a multiple of the square of the LVOT diameter. So any discrepancies in measuring that is going to result in drastic change in what we are uh, wanting to ultimately calculate. So uh, you want to do this while you have maximally zoomed out the LVOT to ensure that you have a highest accuracy in measuring the LVOT diameter. When we are calculating the VTI, we want to do the interrogation of the LVOT in the epical five chamber view. Uh, and that is mainly because we want to ensure that the, uh, the direction of the blood is parallel to the ultrasound uh, beams so as to minimize or the uh, minimize the error. Uh, when we are calculating it via the uh, trans esophageal view, it is done in the mid esophageal long axis view, but we are able to measure the LVOT diameter in greatest accuracy. Uh, whereas the LVOT VTI interrogation is done mainly with the deep transgastric view, where we are able to see LVOT alignment most easily. So when we are calculating the cardiac output, we can uh, consider a three-step approach, but we first want to calculate the diameter or the cross-sectional area and the LVOT, uh, LVOT VTI, that is the integral that is being traced. The stroke volume is a product of those two. And finally, the cardiac output is going to be the product of both the stroke volume as well as the heart rate of the patient. So as you can see, the cardiac output is actually multi uh, um, um, Dependent on multiple calculations, first of all, the heart rate discrepancies, there can be one of the potential pitfalls of measuring cardiac output via echocardiography. Another thing is also the accuracy of the measurement of the cross-sectional area, which I had mentioned earlier. So the limitations, as I can see, of the echo itself is that there might be inter-observer variability that is greatest uh, seen whenever we are trying to calculate the cross-sectional area of the LVOT. Uh, also, we have to see what is the Doppler angle, which is uh, going to, uh, we are assuming it to be at a parallel or near parallel intercept to the blood flow. So whenever you have deviations up to 20%, uh, you can record up to 6% of error. Uh, also, you want to see the velocity and the diameter measurements. Uh, they have to be made at the same anatomical sites. Any discrepancies there will uh, grossly result in over or underestimation, depending upon how close or far away from the aortic valve you are. And also we have to, uh, we assume that the pattern of flow uh, is actually uh, minor, but uh, in reality, the flow profile is quite parabolic in nature. Clinically, however, how much that is significant is not yet determined. So when we are comparing uh, 
this uh, method of echocardiography to our gold standard that is the thermodilution technique um there was a meta analysis that was being carried out by Zhang et al in the year 2019 which demonstrated a good correlation they also went further ahead to see whether uh, a tte versus te evaluation was better and ultimately concluded that te was the better uh, method and their also preferred site was found to be the left ventricular outflow tract the study that was conducted in 2022 by Grand et al. They have used echocardiography versus thermodilution technique to measure cardiac output in a post arrest status. And there was a consistent underestimation that they had noted by this Doppler um, echocardiography method that uh, they found. Um, that while both uh, the thermodilution and Doppler echocardiography showed the similar pattern in terms of improvement or degradation of cardiac output, the corresponding actual uh, numbers were not showing that much of a, uh, that much of similarity. In fact, they found that the Doppler method grossly underestimated the cardiac output of the patient. So a person who is having a normal cardiac output on echocardiography, uh, we can uh, almost uh, state that it is highly unlikely that they are actually having a reduced cardiac output status. So um, if you're going into alternatives or recent advances when we are having this kind of Doppler echocardiography method, um, we have uh, the USCOM monitor which had been initially developed for ICU patients uh, where they're trying to utilize the continuity equation across the aortic and pulmonary arteries. Um, however, uh, the um, uh, while uh, a few studies found that this was a very accurate method, many of them are not able to inter even interrogate the valves, let alone derive accurate values. So uh, the way this technology works is that you have a small non-invasive uh, probe that is placed either in the suprasternal notch, which is going to be able to interrogate the aortic um, valve, and we'll be able to calculate the velocity across the aortic valve and thereby um, uh, develop the or uh, understand the left ventricular outflow state uh, or left ventricular cardiac output particularly. Um, the way that they calculate the aortic valve area, however, is going to be based on the patient's height and body surface area. So most of the times, if there is any pathology like an aortic stenosis or a um, uh, uh, or any calcifications or a bicuspid valve, maybe uh, inaccuracies may then pop up in terms of uh, this technology. Another is a parasternal view that is going to help integrate the uh, pulmonary artery or the pulmonary valve. Uh, another uh, advancement in this era is also the utility of artificial intelligence. Um, in the Indian Journal of Anesthesiology, uh, in an article by Damodar and et al., in COVID-19 patients, they use artificial intelligence technology particularly to uh, look at both the B-line calculation as well as to uh, calculate the LVOT VTI of uh, various patients, which was the automated software available to them. And they found that uh, between the manual and automated software, there was a uh, uh, good agreement in terms of the values that they were achieving. Uh, similar studies later carried out for uh, point of care ultrasound also were showing uh, similar results. Uh, another, uh, another, uh, a monitor which has been developed utilizing both artificial intelligence uh, and uh, traditional concepts is the HTEE, which is a miniature disposable uh, monoplanar uh, transesophageal probe, which can be placed inside a patient for up to 72 hours directly to observe the cardiac filling output, everything. So they have a Clary TEE probe, which is a miniaturized low weight and it has and it has good, um, uh, uh, it has uh, good precision, which is placed in the esophagus uh, uh, of patients, which is accessible easily and can be detached from the monitor. 
um, so that the same monitor can be utilized to monitor multiple present uh, or patients. And also it has artificial te uh, intelligence technology to help with the image quality. So uh, what they suggest uh, or the company suggests is that you can assess the volume responsiveness, the right and left ventricular systolic function and uh, the preload and contractility uh, by just uh, um, moving the probe uh, in the same plane that is by advancing and retracting the probe which can help adjust the various parameters including ventilator settings, your vasopressors, vasodilators and whatever circulatory support may be required. So the take-home message that I found is that echocardiography is a non-invasive to a minimally invasive technique that we can utilize uh, for the estimation of cardiac output. Uh, you can easily utilize it even in non-cardiac surgical setups. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, even the monopolar uh, or the monoplanar probe, uh, they have uh, recently published a study in 2022, which states that uh, they were able to immediately assess uh, a patient's requirement in the post-cardiac surgical care unit. And in fact, even uh, preemptively diagnose uh, tamponades um, which uh, helped in management of the patients. So improvements in the techniques, uh, utility of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, image quality and accuracy and the awareness of all the pitfalls of this uh, monitoring can help in understanding how to utilize it. Because at the end of the day, when we are looking at uh, how to monitor cardiac output while we are uh, looking at just the accuracy, we're also looking at the trends of the cardiac output over a period of time, which is going to point out to patient recovery or deteriorate. So, uh, these were my references for this presentation. Um, thank you. Thank you. That was a nice presentation. Uh, to Dr. Murlidhar for the next presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Atan Gupta. Um, now we have the last presentation of the day um, with some the totally non-invasive technique of estimation of cardiac output using bioreflect uh, bioreactance technique. Dr. Vinod MK will be present in this. He is the chief of critical care and pain services in Shankara Cancer Hospital and Research Center. He has a list his career and uh, uh, he is very well known uh, uh, personality in the field of oncoanesthesia. And he has used this uh, technique extensively in his clinical practice, that is bioreactance, and hence he is the most appropriate person to talk on this subject. So I request Dr. M. K. Vinod to uh, start his uh, talk, and the questions will be answered at the end of the talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, sir. Good evening. I thank Murli Kanchi, sir, for giving me this opportunity to participate in this webinar. My topic is on the role of bioreactants in the measurement of cardiac output. I have no disclosures to make. We all know, and data also suggests, that early aggressive resuscitation of critically ill patients may limit or reverse tissue hypoxia, progression to organ failure, and improve the outcome. So the first step in hemodynamic management of a critically ill patient is to determine the adequacy of tissue or organ perfusion. And although the signs of shock may be obvious, the signs of subclinical hypoperfusion may be subtle. It's been seen that in only 50% of the patients, hemodynamically unstable patients, uh, respond to the volume resuscitation. In such situation, it is very important for us to guide our fluid administration based on the cardiac output and stroke volume responsiveness, lest we overload the patient. Hence, measurement of cardiac output is essential in all patients undergoing major surgery, critically ill and unstable patients, as it provides an indication of the systemic oxygen delivery and global tissue perfusion. 
It also defines the overall functions and performance of the heart, predicts the prognosis and survival in heart failure, and also helps in risk stratification. The thermodilution method using the pulmonary arterial catheter has been considered as a gold standard for measurement of cardiac output. However, it has got a few limitations in the form, in the sense that it is an invasive procedure, it is expensive, it requires special skills for insertion of the pulmonary arterial catheter. And of course, there are some catheter related issues like infection, uh, arrhythmias, and bleeding, which may limit its use. Over the decades, several minimally invasive and non invasive methods have been developed. While most of them are safe, all of them have some limitations in the form of accuracy and reliability when compared to the thermodilution method. This is the evolution of methods uh, for measurement of cardiac output. As you can see, in the 1970s, the pulmonary arterial catheter was introduced. And in the 2000, we had the stroke volume variation and pulse per airway pressure variation. And today we have the non-invasive methods of cardiac output monitoring. Amongst the non-invasive methods of uh, cardiac output monitoring, we have bioimpedance and bioreactance methods. Both of them share some physical principles. The thoracic bioimpedance is based on the assumption that changes in the intrathoracic blood volume during the cardiac cycle uh, induces changes in the electrical conductivity of the thorax that are mainly related to the changes in aortic volume. From this bioimpedance, we can get the stroke volume, cardiac output, and the thoracic fluid content from the output signal fluctuation. Bioimpedance is mainly based on amplitude modulation, whereas bioreactance is based on the frequency modulation and phase shifts. The bioimpedance cardiac output monitors face certain technical and pathophysiological limitations due to extraneous electrical uh, interference, making them less suitable. Coming to the bioreactance or the Starling SV monitor as it is called today, it works on the principle of phase shift or time delay. It is not affected by the size of the patient, thoracic fluids like pleural effusion or pulmonary edema or by the position of the sensors. The first version of the non-invasive cardiac output monitoring that is the NICOM was first manufactured by the Cheetah Medical uh, in Massachusetts. This has been used as a reference standard which has been validated with other cardiac output monitoring systems like the thermodilution and the pulse contour analysis. The initial version provided cardiac output readings averaged over 30 seconds and hence there were some concerns regarding its ability to track the rapid changes in stroke volume. The present Starling device has an averaging time of 8 seconds. <clears throat> now how does the Starling technology work? The Starling monitoring platforms use unique patented bioreactance technology to make continuous measurements. There are four non-invasive sensor pads which are applied around the thorax, creating a sort of box around the heart. A small electrical current of 75 kilohertz of alternating current is applied across the thorax uh, between the outer pair of sensors. The voltage signal is recorded between the inner pair of sensors. The flow of blood in the thorax introduces a time delay or the phase shift in the signal and this monitor uses this phase shift as a baseline for stroke volume measurements. These signal changes have been correlated with the thermodilution cardiac output monitor in about 65,000 patient samples and in multiple clinical settings like the intensive care unit, operating room and the cath lab. The bioreactance assesses the pulsatile flow induced frequency modulation and the phase shifts in voltage across the thorax. There's a hundred fold reduction in the input of extraneous electrical fields on the cardiac output estimates. A non-invasive cardiac output measurement signal is determined from each of the each side of the body of the, of the patient and the final cardiac output is obtained as an average. This is the flow diagram for the cardiac output uh, monitor uh, measurement and uh, towards the end you can see the algorithm for measurement of the stroke volume and the cardiac output. The assessment of the fluid responsiveness using the bioreactance method can be done either by a simple passive leg raise test or the volume bolus test. 
The PLR test involves elevation of the patient's legs to 45 degrees from an initial semi-recumbent position, leading to an auto-transfusion of the volume of blood which is pooled in the lower extremities and the pelvic veins. Detection of an increased stroke volume with this maneuver has been shown to be an accurate predictor of fluid responsiveness with a sensitivity of about 97% and a specificity of 94%. The other method is by infusing a fluid bolus of about 250 ml over in less than uh, 5 minutes or 500 ml in less than 10 minutes and checking for an increase in the stroke volume. In both these techniques, an increase in the stroke volume by 10% indicates fluid responsiveness. In our institution, we use the Starling monitor in patients who are coming for uh, major surgeries like hepatectomies and Whipple's procedures or other major vascular procedures. And especially we use it in those patients with previous cardiac issues. We have used this monitor in about 28 patients so far and uh, mainly we are using it for uh, guiding us in fluid replacement. We have compared the values of the bioreactants that is the Starling uh, monitor with the pulse pressure variation which we get on the Philips monitor and we have seen that it correlates well with the uh, same. During surgery, we use the fluid bolus technique to assess for responsiveness. The present monitor is showing the cardiac index, the stroke volume index in the patient uh, before induction. And these are the values which can be seen or which can be derived by this monitor. This is immediately after induction. As you can see, the cardiac index has dropped a little. This is at the time when we wanted to give a bolus. Uh, we, in fact, gave a bolus and found that the patient was not fluid responsive. This is the dynamic assessment by using the bolus technique. And as you can see here, the stroke volume, the delta SVI is minus 0.4%, indicating that the patient is not fluid responsive. So coming to the advantages and disadvantages of the monitor, the main advantage is its ability to monitor the patients without any invasive central lines or arterial lines. We can use this monitor in patients who are on the ventilator or off the ventilator and in the OT and in the ICU. It's user-friendly, it's quite consistent and comparable to any invasive device. The disadvantages are limited. It is not... Uh, uh, can, it is not uh, uh, reliable in situations where there's no association between the aortic systolic deformation and stroke volume, as in the case of aortic dissection or aortic prosthesis. In neonates, the electrodes occupy almost the entire body of the child. So there are certain studies which uh, indicate that it is not very reliable. Barring if, uh, and uh, we have seen some reservations in. Uh, using this uh, monitor in patients who are undergoing laparoscopic or uh, robotic surgeries because uh, we have found some conflicting uh, results. Coming to the literature and studies monitoring uh, about this, uh, the effectiveness of Starling, there are uh, several studies, more than 100 peer-reviewed publications on Starling and the effectiveness of this machine has been validated in multiple clinical settings. And barring a few studies, most of the papers have shown that Starling Monitor exhibits a reasonable accuracy and reliability in measuring the cardiac output and the fluid responsiveness. Coming to the individual studies, the first uh, major study to be done was uh, by Squara in uh, 2009 in the ICU. It was a prospective study and the objective of this study was to evaluate the clinical utility of the newly arrived device that is the non-invasive cardiac monitoring NICOM based on the chest bioreactants and compared with the cardiac output measured intermittently by the thermodilution method with a pulmonary arterial catheter. Consecutive patients immediately after cardiac surgery in the ICU were a part of this study. And the interventions carried out were cardiac output measurements obtained from the NICOM and the th thermodilution, uh, which were simultaneously recorded minute by minute and compared in about 110 patients. The accuracy, precision, and responsiveness and reliability of the NICOM for detecting the cardiac output and uh, its changes were evaluated they opined that the non-invasive cardiac output system demonstrated acceptable 
accuracy, precision, and responsiveness for cardiac output monitoring in patients experiencing a wide range of circulatory situations. This next study is conducted by Marik et al. And uh, it was in 2013. The main objective of the study was to determine the predictive value of passive leg raise test induced changes in stroke volume index assessed by bioreactants in predicting volume responsiveness in a heterogeneous group of patients in the intensive care unit. The secondary endpoint was to evaluate the change in carotid Doppler flow following the PLR maneuver. The data was collected over eight months in the ICU and any patient whose stroke volume index increased by more than 10% following a fluid challenge was considered as a fluid responder. They concluded that monitoring the hemodynamic response to PLR using the bioreactants provided an accurate method of assessing volume responsiveness in critically ill patients. They also suggested that changes in carotid blood flow following the PLR may be a useful adjunctive method for determining the fluid responsiveness in hemodynamically unstable patients. The next study was conducted by Latam et al. in 2017. This was a retrospective cohort study and the objective was to determine whether the stroke volume guided fluid resuscitation in patients with severe sepsis and septic shock alters the ICU fluid balance. They evaluated uh, consecutive patients admitted to the intensive care unit with the primary diagnosis of severe sepsis or septic shock. And the cohorts were based on fluid resuscitation guided by changes in stroke volume or by usual care. They reported that the patients who received fluids based on the stroke volume received less intravenous fluids during their ICU stay. They had a shorter length of stay and needed lesser vasopressors and were less likely to need uh, hemodialysis. In this study, which was conducted by Rich et al. in 2013, it is a non-randomized study to evaluate the accuracy of uh, non-invasive cardiac output monitoring to measure cardiac output as compared to the reference standards of thermodilution and indirect FIC method in a cohort of patients with pulmonary hypertension who were uh, receiving a right heart catheterization. They evaluated uh, the cardiac output measurements by thermodilution, FIC and Nikon at a baseline and after a vasodilator challenge. And the precision and accuracy of the Nikon were compared to the thermodilution and the FIC method. They concluded that NICOM may allow for non-invasive hemodynamic assessment of patients with pulmonary hypertension and their response to therapy. This study by Waldron et al. compared the NICOM with esophageal Doppler in guiding a goal-directed fluid therapy in patients undergoing colorectal surgery. They concluded saying that the NICOM is as effective as uh, the esophageal Doppler monitor in guiding global directed therapy in colorectal patients. This is a recent article from uh, Japan comparing the simultaneous intra and post operative cardiac index measurements obtained with Starling SV, the flow track, uh, the fourth generation flow track EV1000, and the thermodilution method in 20 patients undergoing OPCAP. They concluded saying that both the Starling and the flow track showed acceptable mean uh, bias, but imprecision due to wide limits of agreement and high percentage errors and poor trending ability. These findings indicate limited reliability in monitoring cardiac index in patients undergoing OPCAP. So as you can see, most of the studies are in favor of using bioreactants, whereas there are some studies which uh, find that it is not as effective. So to summarize, the bioreactance method of the Starling monitor has been shown to be a reliable monitor of cardiac output. It provides reasonable accuracy in monitoring fluid responsiveness in major surgeries and critical uh, ill patients. We all know that it is not possible to have one absolutely flawless technique to monitor uh, or monitor to measure the cardiac output or guide us in fluid management in all the situations. We also need to take into consideration the other markers of tissue hypoxia like lactates and central venous oxygen saturation, which serve as important tools in guiding fluid management. Thank you. Thank you, Vinod, for that uh, lovely presentation. And I now request all the 
panelists and moderators to uh, unmute and uh, keep the videos on. And I request Dr. Rupa to start the discussion. And uh, the speakers also to unmute and uh, be ready to answer any question. Keep the um, uh, videos on all the moderators and speakers. Speaker is very on. Me as such, I'm not. We have about 10 to 15 minutes of discussion. Please, um, the moderators can comment on the content of the webinar and then. Any, any other comment or question you would like to make? Hello, this is Rupa. I think this uh, quality of this webinar was very good. I mean, it was very thorough. All the speakers spoke very well and totally all the topics were covered and, and the speakers spoke extensively on each topic. Um, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so... Now, uh, here we usually use the echo method and uh, and the intermittent thermodilution method. We have also used the flow track and uh, we have the cheetah monitor also. Right, right. So, most commonly used is the echo. What's your experience with uh, cheetah? Do, do you cheetah have... We have uh, we have used it, but uh, we found it more useful in the ICU rather than in the OT. Right. There was a question about uh, what is the difference between transpulmonary thermodilution and flow track. Um, Madhu, followed by Elizabeth. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, the flow track method of cardiac output uh, monitoring uh, in that calibration is not required, sir, in that method. And it is a continuous cardiac output monitoring. Uh, whereas in PICO, we need calibration. And uh, it is an intermittent method of cardiac output monitoring. But when we add a pulse contour analysis to it, uh, a continuous cardiac output monitoring can be done. But uh, yes. similarly, there is one uh, study published in uh, Turkish Journal in 2021. It states that uh, say, uh, cardiac index obtained by previous versions, that is older versions of flow track, had no acceptable agreement with percentage error of 49 to 61% when compared to transpulmonary thermodilution technique by PICO. So the older versions of flow track are not that accurate. So in that case, transpulmonary thermodilution technique is better. But nowadays, recent advances in flow track have come. Even the third generation monitors have come. It shows better accuracy uh, when compared to transpulmonary thermodilution techniques, sir. Yeah, yeah. There, there are two different techniques. Uh, there is no thermodilution needed in flow track. This is a specialized transducer, yes, which uh, determines the characteristics of the arterial system, arterial walls, based on the patient's information entered by the monitor and determines the stroke volume based on pulse counter and then estimates the stroke yes. volume. That is the, they, they are two different techniques. They are not uh, interrelated. They are different techniques. Yes. Any comments from any panelists regarding this? We have used the old generation flow track in that it was uh, when the when everything is good, the cardiac output, blood pressure, everything is good, then it gives quite accurate values. But when things go bad, then the values don't change fast. I mean, you may get good values even when the patient is not doing properly. Right. Maybe right. that is corrected in the new generation. Flow yes. yes, new generation is much better. 
you're right comments from harish ratan deepa over and here in our institute we use uh, flow track only for uh, interoperative management of cases in the icu uh, we usually uh, go by the baxter's uh, stalling monitor oh right 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 See, uh, how does the stalling monitor uh, uh, function in your icu does it give uh, accurate readings you are happy with the information provided uh, yes sir we are extremely happy we have uh, used it for around 65 cases so far right, right. yeah we use it uh, mostly in patients who come with any kind of shock uh, be it the hypovolemic shock uh, in uh, we usually use in major very major uh, cancer surgeries such as uh, cytoreductive surgeries along with hypothermic uh, intraperitoneal chemotherapies where the patients do come on uh, low doses of noradrenaline and uh, when you are in doubt from the ot itself like enormous fluid resuscitation happens for these cases yes and once you get the patients here they are in shock but at the same time you are in doubt should i give fluid or not so right. that time this uh, really helps because it gives you an idea about the cardiac output cardiac index and one additional information that this baxter monitor gives is an idea about the thoracic fluid content so that is even before you start seeing uh, a congested lung field on x ray or a b line on uh, ultrasonography this monitor tells you when the thoracic fluid content increases so that actually helps us to come down on the uh, fluid uh, fluid resuscitation if required whether to start diuretics or not so that is one additional information which we get with a um starling monitor thank you thank you for that input harish you want to comment on this yeah, one, uh, one thing about yes. uh, starling i don't know uh, because uh, uh, see the major principle for starling also for fluid responsiveness uh, remains a plr only and it also give the value of svv uh, a cut off uh, with satisfying all the founders Uh, then uh, like either option is to give external fluid or we have to go for plr only beauty of uh, starling is it gives a some schematic representation okay whether we are in a safe zone and it gives a uh, delta sv that is the stroke volume after giving a plr and all but if you want to use that modality particularly in a patient who is um, just came out of the icu means like ot with a hypex surgery and all uh so that um, i don't think it is um, very well appropriated when uh, undergone such a uh, extensive surgery with the peritoneum open because we need to challenge the system with a, a leg rise uh, to get an idea about change in stroke volume but uh, in otherwise like in a general critically ill patients like a patient with uh, sepsis ards community acquired pneumonia and all uh, where we don't have any challenges to go for plr we can go ahead Uh, but definitely as compared to the bio impedance and all uh, which are having a confounding because of pleural effusion uh, or maybe anything which is in the pleural cavity that is going to interfere with the bio impedance this bio reactants initially chita now they taken over by baxter and they given a name of starling uh, the working principle remains in and around the same as chita but uh, to the previous question like flow track versus uh, transpulmonary thermodilution definitely Uh, both we can't compare in terms of what additional details we get so transpulmonary uh, we have additional details including pulmonary vascular permeability index extra vascular lung water index global end diastolic volume so these three parameters which we can uh, use to play around in terms of preload in terms of extra vasation in terms of differentiation between a, a cardiogenic versus non cardiogenic pulmonary edema Mm-hmm. when we see flow track uh, if you trend either a like stroke volume or a cardiac output cardiac index or again we can use this advanced uh, recent generation of flow track option again to give a plr and see the change in stroke volume so based on the initial value of the svv and all uh, but uh, see for me in a critical care unit uh, even i am not bothered too much on accuracy of the cardiac output a gadget gives uh, because any of Uh, we want to see the changes in stroke volume uh, in relation to either an external fluid uh, challenge or maybe a autotransfusion of uh, 
like uh, PLR and all. Uh, that's why still even any gadget which gives some stroke volume, some cardiac output, uh, since I'm not going to believe uh, that accuracy of that cardiac output or stroke volume, so that is fine for me. Uh, but as compared to the PA catheter, whatever the gadget you use, uh, they are going to be in a sub hierarchy in terms of the accuracy for cardiac output. But it is fine uh, as long as we understand the limitation of any gadget. Yeah, I would like to comment on this uh, one. This one uh, during the uh, immediate post-operative period, as the patient is uh, shifted to the ICU, then you can give a fluid balance, a fluid bolus you know, for measuring the cardiac output or the stroke volume variation. And the advantage of this Starling, what we have noticed is. As you are giving the fluid bolus, you need not complete the 250 ml bolus or 500 ml bolus. As you are giving the bolus itself, you can see some uh, variation in the stroke volume. And uh, with that also, you can gauge that whether the patient is responsive or not responsive. So uh, in patients who have undergone major surgeries like CRS or something like that, they, it need not always be the PLR test. You can give a small fluid bolus and uh, check the uh, variation uh, in the cardiac output and stroke volume. So that is what we have uh, noticed. Thank you. Thank you, Vinod. Rajan, your comments. There are two other questions. I will go to that after you, uh, after your comments. Sorry, sir. Uh, Rajan, sir, you are not audible properly, sir. Your voice is cracking, sir. Uh, Yeah, uh, is it better? Yes, yeah, now it's much better, yes. Yeah, uh, so over the last couple of decades, uh, the changes what I have noticed in uh, the way we function in the uh, cardiac surgical uh, unit, uh, the number of PA catheters have relatively come down. The uh, ultrasound machine or the echo machine has become more ubiquitous. <clears throat> and uh, the pattern we follow is, uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Vinod, uh, the, most of the patients who come out of the theater uh, they are uh, fluid diplomas, uh, they, uh, they are depleted uh, volume wise. So initially we try giving volume and simultaneously we try to uh, check with the echo and see if there's any uh, major problem like a pericardial tamponade uh, or uh, how's the global uh, uh, LV and RV function. If that is all right, we just give volume. And very rarely if the patient is uh, stiff on anotropic support, very high uh, on lactate and acidosis, then we consider putting a PA catheter uh, and PA catheter is definitely a very good uh, tool. It gives you exact uh, numbers to go by. Uh, and uh, the sisters find it very easy to note down the numbers. Whereas the uh, echo, it requires a little bit of, uh, so there's a learning curve. And uh, uh, in case uh, you don't have an experienced operator, you can miss on things when you're using an echo probe. But uh, uh, that is how uh, the trends have uh, changed now. And the other advantage when you're using uh, echo probe is uh, you can also comment on uh, the fluid uh, CDC, uh, measurement and you can uh, look at the B lines to say whether the patient is congested. And also if there's any definitive cause for uh, the patient's deterioration, like a pericardial tamponade or uh, uh, RV distinction, uh, those things can be appreciated, which will not be uh, appreciated when you're using a PA catheter uh, or uh, when you're using other modes of uh, cardiac output calculation. Uh, this is what I have to tell you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ratan, for that uh, comments. This one question about uh, where do you get finger cuff? I mean, probably he wants to know, oh, is it available and uh, who markets it? I think that is the meaning of that question. So, Elizabeth, uh, do you, can you answer that one? Uh, sir, uh, finger cuff is uh, what I, uh, it's uh, this uh, clear sight uh, by Edward Sciences. They have, uh, yes, they have they uh, it and uh, yes, most of the workshops which you attend in, uh, on hemodynamic monitoring, they'll be exhibiting this. Uh, uh, frankly, we are not using it on a routine basis, but it's available. The next question is about um, uh, obtaining LVOT VTI deep transgenic view. Uh, I think Akshita has to reply to this. 
why do you have to use the transverse view and uh, sometimes it may be very difficult to get it good evening again sir am i audible yes 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 uh so so first of all thank you for the opportunity to present and answer to this question sir as far as i am aware the uh, deep transgastric view the angle of the do uh, the doppler angle that i was speaking about would be less than 20 degrees which will give a more accurate result of the lvot uh, vti as opposed to a um uh, just a transgastric view but both have been used in many places in literature sir Uh, recently, in 2022, there was a study that's been published by Curious, where they were doing a comparative study between PSC, uh, that is your pulmonary artery catheter, versus your echocardiography cardiac output monitoring. And this was the same reasoning they used, where they tried to first obtain a deep transgastric view for the patient. If it was not possible because of any other ana uh, anatomical variation, they then uh, resorted to the transgastric view. Sir. yeah that is right the answer is that the echo beam is parallel to blood flow in the deep transgastric view and uh, if it, if you are not able to get the view go for the long axis in the transgastric window at 120 degrees invariably you will see the aorta opening of the aortic valve at the uh, left bottom of the screen the, in the far field so there again you can Interrogate the LVOT using the pulse wave Doppler and get a uh, LVOT VTI. You can use that one. And for diameter, you have to use the uh, LV long axis in the mid of the screen window. Uh, I think th those are the questions which are there in the chat box. If I missed anything, please uh, let me know. Uh, no sir, uh, all have been addressed. Sir. So, any other additional points or uh, comments? Murli sir, can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. Please. Can you hear me, Doctor Murli sir? Yes, yes, I can hear. Please, Doctor Belani is here. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Doctor Belani, please can carry you hear on. me. Yes, yes. Doctor Belani, please carry on. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, we can we hear can, you. We can hear. We can hear you. This uh, the finger blood pressure machine, the FINAP press. That yes, there yes, was, yes. There was a discussion on it. Uh, we've done some studies, uh, which is not published, but we compared it with A line, uh, the regular radial artery as well as the cuff. Uh, in states of vasoconstriction, yes. the finger one doesn't work. It stops working. and so it's not very reliable except during normal hemodynamic status and so that's the time when you're really not concerned about blood pressure right because it's things are normal but yes. when they into when they when you get into trouble then it's not a reliable source you're right thank you thank you for that input i'll vote for the echo any time Transesophageal in the OT and transthoracic in the ICU. The thermal dilution, no doubt, gives good and accurate values. But we need to translate the information provided into clinical use. That yeah. is, we need to tailor our management based on the information provided by using the thermal dilution in the ICU. Yes, you are right. Any other comments? and uh, whatever is the finding the surgeon has to trust the operator and act upon that unless that happens it doesn't help the patient right okay. i think in a critical care setting uh, uh, it's not just a single monitor that's going to help the clinical judgment and a monitor such as a cardiac output monitor like in our setup it's the starling along with that a transthoracic echo so that combination really helps in managing cases we had made some sort of an algorithm based on the mbh class the risk of for surgery and the lvef based on that you can categorize the choice of cardiac output monitoring in the worst clinical scenario we can wait a class 4 and risk of uh, high risk of surgery 
LBF less than 30 percent. Always go for invasive techniques using PA catheters. In uh, good uh, functional status, for example, in my class two and good LBF for 50 percent or so, uh, probably you should um, uh, go for things like flow track and change or whenever there is a deterioration which is not um, uh, responding quickly to your therapeutic manuals. With that uh, comments, I would like to request Dr. Baljit Singh. Before that, I would like to thank and congratulate all the speakers and moderators for being present and uh, done such a wonderful presentations. And thank you so much. We value the presentations. And I request Dr. Baljit Singh to take over to say the vote of thanks. Thank you so much. Sir, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, just now we got a question, sir. Yeah. Uh, yes, in the chat box, I have posted it's from Dr. Imran Hussain Bhatt saying, How about the effects of peripheral arterial disease on uh, transpulmonary cardiac output measurements? Peripheral arterial disease on transpulmonary thermodilution technique. So this should be answered by Madhu. Is Madhu there, please? Dr. Madhu, are you there? I don't see her there. Anybody else would like to answer this one? Presence of peripheral arterial disease, what is it influence? No oh, impact. Uh, see, as long as the uh, femoral arterial site where we insert the uh, sensor is free, it's not going to impact. So it's not going to impact. Only the problem is if to such an extent, uh, if artery got grafted, femoral artery grafted and all, so then... Uh, that is not that is one of the relative contraindication. Otherwise, it's not going to have any impact with the peripheral artery. I agree with that um, response. It should not have because we are not. Uh, uh, it's it is uh, femoral arterial catheter and central venous line. Those those are the two requirements for this method of monitoring. And if there is no femoral arterial disease uh, or uh, as uh, Harish said about the presence of graft there, uh, it should be fine. With that, we'll conclude this session. Thank you so much, Dr. Baljit Singh. Uh, uh, the, from the ICA, I request him to say the vote of thanks, and then we see you next week. Bye, Dr. Murthy. I'll uh, we come to the end of the interesting Thank you, uh, Dr. Nishant, uh, Dr. Madhu, Elizabeth, uh, Akshita, and Dr. Vinod. And of course, uh, uh, the moderators, uh, you know, by Dr. Mulida, Dr. Rupa Shrida, Dr. Deependra, Dr. Harish, and Dr. Ratan Gupta. Well, uh, they, uh, you know, they, they gave the recent advances with regard to the monitoring that we have, whether it's for cardiac patient or for non-cardiac uh, you know, patient. And uh, uh, I also thank the participants after the uh, presentations and they enriched uh, everyone with uh, their knowledge. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Bellani. You know, uh, it must be very early morning on that part of the world where he uh, stays. So uh, he deserves special thanks. And uh, uh, before I, uh, you know, say goodbye, uh, thanks to Leonard also for uh, the, you know, for presenting. Uh, thank you so much, friends. On behalf of Indian College of Anesthesiologists, I thank all uh, uh, the speakers as well as uh, the uh, moderators. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week. Uh, till then, uh, goodbye and uh, good health. God bless. Thank you. Thank